Yeah, we are live streaming for the first time, first time on Facebook. So thanks very much for uh, being here. We're so happy. Um, we are going to talk about something that is pretty debated, at least as far as I can see from the questions we have. Um, as cigar sense, we have guidelines, but we wanted to ask the scientist to answer this question. Um, we want to frame the topic so that we understand some more aspects of the tasting. So we're also talking about mind and mindset. Welcome, uh, Constantine Heidkamp. He has a solid scientific background. He started his career with a strong interest in the scientific backgrounds of wine, other beverages and food. He earned four degrees from two exceptional institutions and has expanded his scope to all aspects of experiences from a perspective of sensory science. He contributed to the setup of the sensory evaluation process at Cigar Sense, and I'm very, very pleased and proud of that. And he is now Chief Science Officer and Head of Product Development at Hawaiian Ola Brewing Company. Please feel free to ask questions when Stan makes a logical break or at the end. Um, I encourage people on Zoom to ask the questions directly here. And if we have any questions on Facebook, I will check that. So thank you, Constantine, or better Stan, as I call you. <laughs> thank you, Stan, for being here. I'm very happy. The floor is for you. Stan, you are muted and I cannot unmute. Okay. Yes, <laughs> the, the message just popped up. Yes, thank you. So let me start again. Thank you very much, Branka. Aloha, everybody from uh, very early Kailua Kona, Hawaii uh, this morning. Um, let me uh, reiterate one thing that Franca already said. Um, I am currently on my phone, so um, if you are joining us in, uh, in Zoom, you can speak up at any time. Otherwise, Franca will have to play the moderator for me a little bit, but uh, by all means, make it more interesting for both yourselves and me by asking questions throughout. Um, as you see fit, as they arise, um, I have a rough outline but i tend to do these uh, relatively unscripted so even if you just need to rein in uh, my time feel free to do so so the topic we chose for today may sound simple but has a lot of aspects to it so um in broad strokes i will uh, start with a uh, with some mindset uh, considerations frame of mind uh, considerations when approaching tastings um, we will have to consider various aspects of tasting and um, goals of tasting, I would say, throughout. And I guess at this point, we can uh, also pitch our podcast series um, for a lot of background and a lot of um, detail and considerations of some of the aspects we may brush over today. Uh, Franca has actually already compiled a large um, a library of podcasts, interviews, uh, different perspectives from industry. So um, we recorded a sensory science seminar um, a while ago as well. So some of those uh, for future reference are already available for you. Um, after the mindset considerations, we will then um, think more applied. So think through the process of tasting a cigar and what we may use before, during and after to make sure we can get either the most objective um, impression of that cigar, which is sometimes one goal of tasting, or the most enjoyment out of it, which may be a conflicting, um, conflicting goal, depending on um, how we consider it. So uh, I already touched on it briefly um, as cigar smokers and connoisseurs. Uh, in general, cigars are for us a means of enjoyment, um, a ritual, a pleasure, and that goes along with certain settings, sometimes with mindsets, and um, depending on how you frame those for yourself, that is either very conducive to the tasting or it is just 
that, a ritual, a pleasure, something you enjoy, and throughout you may be phasing in and out of um, tasting, perceiving, consciously reflecting on what you are perceiving in that cigar. So that is the first big distinction we need to make. For um, cigar sense, obviously, um, we see it in a very rigorous technical uh, aspect, which is a good part of my background. Um, I spent years and years uh, in either as a participant panelist or organizer of wine panels specifically, um, some food, si food science uh, panels, recipe development, etc. So in all of those settings, First of all, there's never just one. It's always a group usually that tastes and that initially uh, comes up with a vocabulary, which for example, for Cigar Sense, we have done. And if you know the flavor wheel that's available to you, that is um, partially the result of that process. And then there's the individual um, tasting sections that you go through, which for technical applications like that are very isolated, highly standardized, and usually feature several samples at the same time and sometimes an element of comparison, which depending on how you conceptualize it, if you're smoking one cigar, that is one sample at a time, it takes a much longer time. Uh, we may consider at the end of this talk that maybe each puff is its own sample and how that informs how we approach that. But before all that, if you're not in the right condition or the right mind um, to do a tasting that or you can still smoke that cigar in our case, but it won't be an objective assessment. It won't be a tasting. Um, so as much as we talk about mental hygiene these days, if you're interested in perceiving the most out of your cigar and giving it a fair shakedown, um, you probably want to go through a little bit of preparation for yourself. Now, some of that is purely uh, physical. You know, cigars are in many ways a lot more time consuming and a lot more taxing on us than some other modalities may be. Um, so for example, if you're tasting food, you know, it is small manageable portions usually. So even if you've already had a meal, um, you can taste bites of different things and your satiety and satiation may affect how you perceive it, but it's not going to be um, overpowering. Or in the wine tasting scenario, um, I already alluded to, you may have six samples, but the organizer of that panel makes sure that even if you drink everything, you will not get inebriated, all those things. With cigars, it is um, purely up to us, of course, and you probably know your own um, nicotine sensitivity. You probably know times of day that work better for you than others. So one of the framing things there is physical preparation, right? You should be rested. You should be in a balanced mood, let's call it. So um, of course, we love that experience when we're in a really bad mood and we start smoking a cigar, not expecting something. It turns our mood around and all those things, but it's not a a fair assessment of that cigar, then it's a, let's say, a hedonistic, um, hedonistic pursuit, and it's not necessarily a tasting in, uh, in that sense. Similarly, you know, I've talked about nicotine very briefly there. You probably want to have had a meal sometime before um, you enjoy that cigar, just so the nicotine does not overwhelm you. But Obviously, you know, eating involves all our senses and especially our taste buds, and you do not want any residual from that. So probably that meal should have been an hour before you light up that cigar, if not longer. You probably should have uh, rinsed your mouth several times uh, in between. It should not have been a heavy meal. It should probably not have been an extreme meal, meaning a very spicy food, for example certain stimuli, and we'll get back to this later, of course, but certain stimulations and tastes really bind to your tongue and take hours or sometimes longer than that um, until you can taste the full intensity of that one sensation again. So all of those are already things to be mindful of. But then as you sit down, and this is, of course, something we encourage for um, our panelists and 
one of the reasons why I currently am not reviewing a, a lot of cigars for Cigar Sense is setting. You need to have a setting that is familiar, quiet, uh, reproducible, uh, comfortable for you, and that you can keep um, as constant as you possibly can in a very technical tasting in companies, for example, that would literally be a sensory deprivation booth. So uh, a white table, a white booth around you so you don't see anybody around you. Um, standardized lighting, all those things. We don't have that as cigar consumers, but we don't need it um, as much because a lot more of what we're focusing on is purely um, the tasting and you could just could theoretically just close your eyes while you smoke that cigar. But um, as you prepare to light up, you will of course you know, look at that cigar, smell that cigar, all those things. And certain considerations are always good to get you in that mindset and get you focusing on that cigar. And the first of that is just to remind you of expectations. It's uh, expectations are the bias and they can be a very strong bias that can really uh, throw off your, your ability to give it a fair tasting. So it's always good to visualize and remind yourself of those so you can then detach yourself from them. So obviously you will have um, previous experience with how a cigar looks. So now if you have a wrapper leaf that looks the specific way that you remember, and if you remember that was a cigar you didn't like that looked like that, something you need to notice and something you probably need to consciously put aside uh, to give that cigar a fair chance. The, um, the visual aspect of the cigar, I mean, we'll ask Franca at the end, but if you uh, try to extrapolate purely based on optics how that cigar is going to taste, that's probably not a very reliable um, predictor of your, your experience. Similarly, um, construction, and we probably all have slight personal preferences of how we like our draw to be, but you will go in with an expectation of there should be air moving th through the cigar and hopefully not too much resistance and all those things. But um, no two cigars are the same if it is a handmade product. So start thinking about the tradition, um, the people involved, the craft aspect of it. And you're visualizing all these things so that at the end, you can crumple up that piece of paper, so to say, and put it aside and not focus on those. But um, I bring up the artisanal aspect, the craftsmanship aspect, because in any product and in any kind of assessment like that, I think it is very, very important to, to never forget how many people are involved with that product. So what I'm getting to is, the baseline respect is probably something you want to maintain at all times. Um, certainly, you know, if you're a professional in any of these industries, you simply cannot allow yourself to be disrespectful. But uh, also as a consumer, it is a good thing to keep in mind how many people's hard labor and sometimes proverbial blood, sweat and tears went into producing this product. And so, let's say a grounding in a sense of respect is probably not a bad thing or um, a detrimental thing to your experience. Um, it prevents you from jumping to that extreme, which would be you don't like something and you trash it um, immediately, even just, I guess you can be that honest with yourself, but realize that that is also, um, you know, a bias, maybe not, uh, not a fair thing to do. So I think with that, let me glance down at my little uh, script of notes here. I think we've covered the mindset aspect and the frame of mind aspect um, to the extent that is uh, conducive to this discussion. Um, I'll glance over it really quickly, but basically if you want to develop a mantra for yourself of what are the things I need to remember, what are the things I need to consider, and how do I consciously detach myself from them so they don't drive my experience and drive um, the tasting of this, then that is um, a good pursuit. 
Uh, let me close there maybe on something that um, I heard Jose Blanco say at an industry tasting uh, one time, which interesting concept, but he handed out samples, of course. And the first thing he said is, don't think about construction, don't think about combustion, take those as a given. Because of course, ideally, the factory will have taken care of that. Uh, now, all of our experiences probably tell us that that is not a 100% reliable statement, but you can see what he was trying to do there. He was trying to preface and focus um, the attendees' attention away from purely mechanical or um, expectation-based um, expectation biases to allow them to really taste the differences in those, uh, those samples to have an educational experience and a a representative uh, experience at that. Um, do we ha currently have any questions? Otherwise, I will move uh, right along. I saw somebody typing there a second ago. Yeah, I think it's a question that might be naturally answered in your second part. Okay. Very good. So um, I talked about the mindset a little bit. I mentioned the uh, physical aspects, and these are not to be underestimated really so we talked about you probably want to have uh, have had a meal you want to be rested you want your palate to be rested your nose to be rested so physiologically speaking a lot of those things are adaptation based and we'll touch on the the concept of adaptation several times uh, for the remainder of this talk so Whenever you have a sensory experience, especially uh, relating to taste and smell, it leaves a temporary imprint, right? It's a mechanical action, basically, or chemical interaction of something binding to your receptors. And depending on what kind of receptor that is and how irritant the stimulant was, it will take some time for that receptor uh, to free up again. So. I mentioned hot food, meaning spicy food, um, which is, of course, capsaicin most famously, so the heat from chilies, which is a trigeminal uh, stimulation more than anything else. So not an actual uh, taste bud interaction, but direct interaction with one of our cranial nerves that runs through our palates and mouths. But especially with uh, spiciness like that, you know it lingers for a while as far as the sensation and it really only goes away because your brain consciously, well, subconsciously, I guess, but your brain makes an effort to elevate other signals by tuning out and making that spiciness fade out of your awareness. It's still there because in the case of uh, capsaicin spiciness, that receptor, that nerve ending, dies, well, dies, it's not, a, not necessarily an animate object, but that nerve ending is destroyed by that interaction and needs to be rebuilt. Um, obviously, we have high densities of these, so we don't lose our, our sensitivity to spiciness entirely um, just from eating one spicy meal, but your sensitivity will be different, and it takes up to two weeks uh, for some of those receptors or nerve endings to be reestablished. Um, frequent exposure, of course, will also drive if and how many of those will uh, regrow. So if you only eat spicy food all the time, there may be less nerve endings forming every single time they reform. And of course, your brain will also adapt to that. Personal preference, entirely cultural aspect, of course. But if you're thinking about um, a tasting experience, that will, of course, drive your, your perception. Uh, similarly, not as much in cigars, but if you are a pipe smoker, um, you're probably aware of what they call tongue burn, which is literally the steaming, uh, the steam coming off with that smoke of the pipe affecting your palate, which in many ways is similar to um, eating or drinking something that is too hot. You burn your, your physically burn the surface of your tongue and your taste buds there by that experience sometimes. Um, the good news is just as with the, uh, the spiciness I discussed, it is reversible. It's not generally forever. It's not that you're losing that sense, but uh, you will have lost that sense for a certain amount of time 
until it reforms. Um, always something that's that's good to keep in mind. I think as cigar smokers, you know, uh, to a small degree, we all go through that because we know cigars can be harsh and can be spicy beyond just the aspect of what that may say about the the cigar. So when you're a novice cigar smoker, you probably have a phase of adapting in the very beginning. Um, similarly, you know, the thing will come to towards the end. If you remember when you smoked your first couple of cigars, that aftertaste negatively lingered until the next day. And um, it's one of the big problems people struggle with when they try to get into a new hobby that is cigar smoking. They complain about uh, the bad taste it leaves on their tongue for an extended period of time. It's an interesting question whether, you know, maybe by virtue of getting used to it, we increase our saliva flow rate and it cleans it away faster, or more likely it's probably, again, your brain getting used to, there's a stimulus there that lasts a long time and it's uh, preventing me from being sensitive to other things, so the brain uh, regulating that perception down and thus, you know, us feeling refreshed a little bit, a uh, bit quicker than before. So, um, rested tongue and nose, we're back to that topic. Um, we discussed it from the food, um, from the food aspect. Um, I talked about saliva flow rate there a minute ago. This comes back to uh, the time of day and the personal type of taster you are. Um, some people have higher saliva flow rates than others, and we know for a fact, especially in wine and red wines, that this greatly affects what people like and how they perceive certain things, like the astringency of tannins in red wine, um, which is that drying sensation on your palate, um, really depends on your saliva flow rate. Within yourself, no matter which type you are, high flow, low flow, somewhere in between, you go through cycles throughout the day and you probably know exactly what I'm talking about. By late morning, when it gets towards lunchtime, you probably find yourself salivating a little more. And that is one of those phases that you go through throughout the day. It is also different composition of saliva. So what you ate or what you will eat will, um, will affect the mineral composition of your saliva there, which again will also give you um, taste differences if you then try to perform a tasting task. So there are a lot of things that you need to make yourself aware of to become a better taster, because if we're talking about technical aspects of tasting, you're trying to calibrate yourself, right? So it's not just about the enjoyment and the hedonistic pleasure of it, it may be about treating yourself like a lab instrument in that one, one scenario of assessing a product. And it takes a lot of training and time to get a grasp on the mindset aspect as well as your physical um, condition, <clears throat> excuse me, and how that affects, um, affects your tasting ability throughout the day. Pardon me for a second. Speaking of water and drawing sensations, yes. Um, Let's touch on the nose first. So as you know, this, our sense of smell is incredibly important in our everyday lives, but it's one of those senses that we generally do not pay as much attention to. It's much more a subconscious, um, a subconscious thing, you know, the fight or flight response when we smell a fire somewhere and smoke somewhere. That's when it pops in our mind. Otherwise, unless we train ourselves and pay attention, um, a lot of smells go unnoticed throughout, uh, throughout our days until you train yourself. And you don't have to, un if you don't like it, of course, but you will find that it really enhances um, your ability to appreciate certain products, to appreciate um, experiences as a whole, as well as, of course, building a vocabulary. Um, I'll harken back to our sensory science uh, lecture there for just one second, because when we put words on, a, on an experience, that is something we have to learn. That is a connection we need to establish in our minds because our olfactory center and our language center are on different hemispheres of our brain and no initial connection between them. So putting a word to something we perceive is incredibly hard. 
and it only gets easier with um, with training or with practice and with time as you pay attention to it. So usually, you, ideally, if you are in that quiet space of yours where you will, will have that cigar, there probably won't be any smells you will perceive, but you may still, of course, have something uh, stuck in your nose, basically stuck to those receptors. So if you wanted to go very, very far with it, you can probably blow your nose to clear it. Um, I have not heard of tasters using nasal irrigation before tasting, but maybe to some people, uh, especially during allergy season, uh, that may be something. With cigars, you know, there is that irritating element, be it the smoke, be it uh, dust particles. So if you find that your nose dries out through a tasting, maybe a, a saline nasal spray, maybe something you can try at some point, because of course your sense of smell works better if your mucous membranes um, are not dried out. It's um, part of that whole aspect is as you learn and progress in your tasting, maybe that is something you can, uh, you can consider. Um, British Airways famously wanted to hand out um, saline nasal sprays to its first class customers so they could appreciate the food on board more. But uh, that concept never, never really went anywhere. As you continue through your tasting then, you will of course feel that certain aromas linger longer and some of that is physically in your nose. Some of that is uh, what we call the retronasal perception. So stuff from your oral cavity as you breathe out, passing by um, your olfactory bulb again and being picked up again. Um, for anything that is physically in your nose, uh, what people talk about as resetting your nose is smelling your own skin. With the big caveat, of course, that if you used a scented soap or scented hand lotion or any scented products, that's not really um, working the way it's supposed to do. What people usually do is smell their hand or um, some people have misconstrued that as smell your elbow, which is becoming physically more challenging uh, every day. The idea really just is that you have a baseline scent of your own, a body odor, that you do not perceive yourself. So that is as close to something neutral as you can smell physically um, around yourself. The other option, of course, is if you have that glass of water next to you, you can smell your water, but uh, we'll get into water in a couple of, uh, couple of minutes there because there are a lot of considerations with that. Um, when we think about a cigar experience now, um, how often do you need to clean? So you need to start with a clean and rested palate um, and tongue that ideally is free of any stimulation and free of any lingering tastes. So um, you can judge that best yourself if you still feel like you have an oily slick on your tongue from something you ate, then that is something you may want to consider addressing. In wine tastings, traditionally, of course, you use a uh, very bland white bread or um, saltines, as they're called in the US. So basically unseasoned, unleavened, unsalted flour crackers that are um, as close to bland and as close to neutral as you can possibly get in a food. But it is a food, meaning it does leave residue, it does leave something on your uh, palate in between your teeth around your entire oral cavity. So the result of that is you have to rinse with water and not quite gargle, but rinse your mouth out with water or whatever other uh, rinsing medium you choose, which, you know, drinking a sip of water or even just rinsing your mouth out uh, with water before starting a tasting is not a bad idea if you are in doubt. Um, sometimes, you know, if, especially if you have a tasting schedule and you know yourself well enough, your palate may be perfectly rested and you may be producing enough saliva at that uh, given moment to where it doesn't feel like your mouth is dry. In that case, water would be almost detrimental because of course our saliva is very complex and the interactions with food and other things we taste are a significant part of um, our perception. So purely replacing that with water is not as effective as having your own uh, saliva flow rate there. 
But um, as you start into that cigar, and depending on the cigar, it will, of course, um, leave tastes in your mouth. It may leave stimulation in your mouth. So a lot of cigars start with a blast of spice or pepperiness that either is an aroma and mostly a tingle you perceive as an aroma, or it could be physical spiciness, which is just the same as capsaicin is. It's that trigeminal nerve uh, stimulation. So literally irritating your cranial nerve there. Um, depends a little bit on how much you enjoy that, but it may linger a while. And if it distracts you and if the lingering bothers you and it has these other effects of either it increases your saliva flow rate or it makes your mouth dry, that is probably the, the moment when you will automatically reach for a beverage. And now you could have a lot of different beverages with your cigar. But, you know, uh, there is no, no scientific cigar tasting, I guess, to the same extent as there is wine tasting or food panels and consumer tastings in those areas. But the industry standard in pretty much any modality that you're tasting is generally water. Because it is neutral, because it is hydrating, it is, you know, a large part of our physical makeup, a large part of what makes up our saliva. So um, if you were to dehydrate throughout a tasting, you wouldn't produce as much saliva, which will affect um, the way you taste things. So water is usually a, let's say, a safe default option. Usually in serious studies, that would be distilled water. Um, so free of minerals, free of any odor. Um, it is the big caveat with smelling your glass of water as I was just doing, because I know that is filtered water that I'm drinking there, but it is not free of smell. So I actually have to look at the filter again. But if you're just thinking tap water, and especially around the US, um, tap waters are different in composition depending on where you are geographically located, of course. And most tap water supplies around the world are chlorinated, of course, which is, depending on the level it is added, a very, very strong, noxious smell that would distract you there. So filtered water, distilled water are some standards that are used often. Um, it depends a little bit also on the good old discussion of does water taste like anything? And if you've had mineral waters, you know for a fact that yes, waters taste off things, depending on how they are composed, and they taste different. So this is also where, again, your preference as well as certain objectives you may try to achieve with that water will come into play. A lot of still waters, let's say, will be um, not quite bland and boring, or maybe you see it that way, but they will just have a rich, um, a richness to them, a certain weight to them. Uh, the ideal one you can imagine here will just taste watery, but what water ever does, um, it is one of those discussions, you know, it's uh, especially when it comes to red wine, we've always been searching for something that's better than water. Um, haven't found it yet, found it yet but um, you can concoct various water-based rinsing solutions that are trying to serve functionalities. So red wine, for example, being very astringent and leaving that drying sensation in your mouth and being quite aggressive, you can actually make water with additions of something like carboxymethyl cellulose, which makes it thicker, it makes it oilier. It is much closer to the um, to the viscosity of your saliva, so you're trying to replace something there that the experience is taking away. Um, hopefully your cigar is not going to be that harsh, and depending on the experience, the water may be perfectly fine. Um, I would recommend still room temperature water, and uh, we'll be circling back to those aspects uh, several times as well. Um, you don't want something that is very hot, for scalding your, scalding your palate, or that is very cold, because each of those interferes too much with your tongue's ability to perceive something that is to follow. Um, cold beverages, famously, of course, will just numb your palate, 
And of course, your body temperature is going to bring the temperature of your tongue back up to normal within a couple of minutes, but it is introducing variation. If you try to visualize it, you'd be chilling your palate, it would heat up again. And generally how that works, especially with the dynamics of a cigar, um, at which point do you take that puff? Uh, your tongue may not be in the, in the perfect condition to receive and appreciate that puff, I guess. So close to room temperature. Now, what is room temperature? Uh, in my case, it's probably uh, a little too warm, but anything possibly between slightly chilled 55 to 70 degrees Fahrenheit. So uh, let's call it 15 to 20 Celsius is probably a very good uh, moderate starting point. Now, if you like sparkling water, there is nothing inherently wrong with it, except of course that CO2, the effervescence in that water is a stimulus of its own. And it is what we consider a noxious stimulus. It is a weak acid. So you will taste a little bit of acidity in that water at times, but really CO2 has a very strong stinging sensation. It is actually um, stimulating those same nerve, nerve endings that the spiciness, uh, the capsaicin is. So it's irritating your facial nerve um, on your palate, as well as if you think about smelling that water again, if it is sparkling water, most of the time, you'll have that reaction where the CO2 stings your nose and that noxious, uh, noxious reaction, noxious stimulus will literally knock you back physically. It's just um, a protective reflex we have, right? So mildly sparkling water may still work. Um, this is all, of course, uh, a great debate. I spent about uh, one and a half years of my time studying in Germany, being part of a water panel. And this was uh, two specific mineral water companies pitching their entire portfolio. And basically from a scientific standpoint asking, can we show that a certain type of our water will pair better with wine styles? So it literally was that we chose um, a dozen different wine styles from sweet whites to dry white wines, uh, heavy red wines, light red wines, all of that, and combined them with all these different waters, still water, medium effervescence, different salt contents, highly sparkling water. Um, it was hard work. It was also entertaining, very rewarding, interesting, a great learning experience. And then you come to the point where conclusions are drawn and you find that as it so often works, a large group of tasters, statistics and all of that, very different preferences for, um, for stimulations in that group. So uh, one of the suggestions of that study came out to be that with a heavy red wine that leaves that drying sensation on your palate, allegedly most people preferred the heavy sparkling water heavily carbonated sparkling water, which to me was the worst possible choice because you have aggressive tannin that is drying and biting down on your palate and just no, you know, too much friction on your palate. And then you drink sparkling water and it just foams up and stings and that CO2 is really an aggressive uh, stimulation on top of that other one. But people felt it, it rinsed out their mouth better. Uh, for me, the still water worked better with the, uh, with the red wine and the sparkling water I liked with the white wines, especially the sweeter white wines to balance something there. So you can see how preference comes into this quite frequently. And as long as you're aware of it and you can standardize yourself for it, um, there's nothing wrong with going with your uh, own pre uh, preference there. Now, the last thing with waters, of course, is if you are using mineral waters, mineral is in the name, they will have very different mineral profiles. Um, that is where the taste differences, however subtle they may be, uh, come from. So some waters almost taste oily and sweet and others taste, um, let's say lean and crisp and refreshing would be the, uh, the sales pitch, but um, chalky, I guess is how I would call it. Usually those are waters with a high chalk content or just high carbonate, uh, carbonate salt content, which almost have texture to them. It is something you can physically feel while you have that sip of water on your, 
on your tongue. A um, little bit of personal preference there, of course, but be aware that this physical and chemical composition of your water will interact with uh, what you're trying to do, which if you're using that water to clean your palate while doing a tasting, there may be interactions there. Now, in thinking about this, um, I already devised a little experiment for myself because physically speaking, as you smoke that cigar, given how the tobacco was cured and uh, fermented and processed and all those things, the smoke starts on the acidic side, so the low pH spectrum. And as you continue smoking that cigar and the resins and the condensates build up, the pH of that smoke changes into the alkaline spectrum. Now, to some extent, that will explain why we per perceive evolution in a cigar. Um, aromas especially are very pH dependent and they're generally much more volatile at the low pH end of the spectrum. So um, if something just, you know, if a cigar seems more aromatic and defined and clean in the beginning, that may be one of the factors that is at play there, whereas as it continues, the condensate will interfere with it, of course, and that higher pH may actually make individual aromas and flavors stand out less. So that may be uh, an interaction that is going on there. Now, the fun experiment, only people like such as myself usually find this fun, but what if we could balance the pH of that smoke with different waters. So if you have acidic smoke in the beginning, you would want that high carbonate content uh, water because chalk and carbonate are very alkaline. It doesn't necessarily mean that that water in itself is very alkaline, but the carbonate in the water will basically neutralize the acid um, left by the smoke on your tongue and may be more effective at cleaning uh, your tongue at that point. The interesting question with that, of course, is you're now changing the experience, you're modulating it, and we keep about cleaning our palate, whereas we also talk about evolution with cigars. So this is the tricky question that you have to reconcile for yourself and your specific application. Um, in a technical tasting of wines, you would taste a sip of water and wait two or three minutes or maybe even five minutes between tasting different samples. But those are indeed different samples. With the cigar, you rarely smoke more than one cigar at the same time, even though smoking two cigars at the same time can be very educational. And you are driven by the mechanics of that cigar, meaning um, between puffs, you have a certain amount of time that depends on the mechanics of the cigar, the construction, your style of smoking, of course. You could treat each individual puff off of that cigar as its own sample, in which case, yes, you may have that sip of water between each puff. But in many ways, that defies what we enjoy in cigars, which is that evolution, that progression. And so much of the cigar experience, more so than most other modalities we taste, are based on actual aftertaste, on residue left on your tongue, on tastes and flavors remaining after you've taken that puff and building over time. And comes back to evolution now where some cigars evolve a lot, some cigars change a lot throughout the course. Um, a lot of cigars, though, just seem to be that crescendo where they very slowly change and they intensify, and we perceive that as another form of evolution. A lot of that may be based on the physical reality of it, which is if that cigar, for example, starts very peppery, that means your trigeminal nerve has been overstimulated in that beginning and your brain has started adapting to it and basically tuning out that one stimulus in order for you to be able to perceive other things. Your brain does this um, specifically as a protective measure because if there's always the same note, it covers everything else up and you may miss something that's important uh, in the fight or flight response. You know, Again, that is why we're so sensitive to smoke when we don't expect it. And so, how much evolution of a cigar is driven just by that physiological 
interaction that we see there and the um, psychological and mental adjustment that is something we can't really train away is an excellent question. So for that purpose, if you took that sip of water between each puff, you will probably reduce that to some extent. How much you can depends on that cigar. But basically, if you were to rinse every puff out of your mouth, you will probably see a little less evolution in that cigar because you don't have the lingering stimulus, which we prize in cigars, actually. So um, the good consensus position there is you probably will know when you want to drink something because that taste has become unpleasant or stale or it's just too spicy, it's too smoky, or you have that drying sensation that the smoke left, or even worse, bitterness, of course. So um, you will find out and have a hunch about when you want to have that sip of water or not. Um, that was a fairly long chapter on water and we could continue on there a lot and a lot longer, but I would like to shift a little bit right now towards um, maybe some other drinks you may consider, some other modalities you may consider, but um, are there any uh, questions currently about water specifically? Uh, let me see again in Facebook. Yeah. Um, uh, Seltzer water can be assimilated to carbonated water, so I guess you have answered already. A little bit, yes. And um, the world of water is, is fascinating um, in and of its own right, and water chemistry is relatively complex, lots of interactions. Uh, you heard that I work for a brewery uh, these days, even though we're really a craft beverage company, we do all kinds of things, but famously in brewing, in beer, water chemistry and water treatment are of utmost importance. Um, traditional beer styles usually evolved because the local water supply was of a specific uh, composition. So classic example, extremely soft, low mineral content water in Pilsen in the Czech Republic, where they started making lagers from Bohemian uh, Pilsener malt, or um, one of the alternatives then, the other extreme example would be Dublin water or Burton-on-Trent water, both of which of course are in the UK, which are very high in carbonate, um, very high in sulfate in the case of Burton-on-Trent, and it modifies um, how that beer tastes. And it actually makes something like Guinness, a dark beer style, possible because dark grain is very acrid, it's very acidic, it has a lot of very harsh um, flavor components until it gets mixed with that high carbonate water, which actually neutralizes that charred grain and makes it into something that tastes a lot smoother than it normally would. All right, any more uh, water questions otherwise? Um, Not for the time being, maybe? No, I think we, we, can, uh, we can continue and then we can summarize um, and see yep. if there are any more questions. Uh, yeah, yep, of course. Something from so, Valerie in the in the Facebook comments, but unfortunately, I have just uh, lost it. I cannot see it anymore. So if it comes up again, I will tell you. Okay, very good. Yeah. Okay. Um, I think we've uh, mostly covered uh, water and some of the considerations. Now, I said water is an industry standard. It usually is, but then when it comes to cigars and cigar tasting, you know, uh, we don't quite have that scientific background as readily, readily uh, available to us. You know, I wish I could do cigar tasting panels at a major university and start building um, a lot of the stuff we've been building over decades for wine and other food products, but uh, simply from a regulatory uh, standpoint that is, of course, unwanted. So, a lot of it is left to, uh, to us to develop and to us to enjoy, I guess. And um, I haven't been stressing it as much uh, in this talk as I have in all the others I'm, uh, I have given, but um, all of these are guidelines. And whenever we uh, check our assumptions in studies, 
when it comes to uh, human liking and human uh, perception of that, our own preferences override everything. So I will just briefly emphasize here again, unless it's a highly technical uh, tasting that you're trying to attempt or you really want to focus on that one aspect, you can probably stick to what you enjoy and still get a good experience out of this. But um, as we transition now into other things you may uh, consider having with your cigar, the one big caveat is that anything other than water that you have with your cigar will modify that experience. And arguably, you could say it will take away from that experience because it will change the way you perceive that cigar. So um, one very interesting thing that Franka shared with me, and uh, I wasn't able to listen to that podcast yet, but uh, apparently in some cigar factories, um, roasted but unsalted almonds are recommended as something to eat before tasting a cigar. And I found that fascinating for, for various reasons. Um, it may be, you know, the cigar equivalent of that saltine cracker you use in wine, but um, the way I think about it is what's the time frame before the tasting when you have those, uh, those almonds. So first of all, almonds, um, nuts, high in, high in fats, which is probably why they're being used, and I'll get to that in a second. But uh, my first thought is most almonds you buy, unless you're in California or the Middle East somewhere, are usually verging on rancid. They may be uh, traveled a long time, they may be quite old, and rancid fat is the last stimulus you want if you want to taste something else. So that was uh, my first thought with it. But I think the fat in this case is supposed to um, really serve a specific purpose. Um, I imagine that the cigar is not immediately lit up after you ate those almonds. You would have you know, pieces of almonds stuck in your teeth and all of that. But if you eat that handful of almonds and then probably wait 10 or 15 minutes and probably rinse your mouth with water again, you will still have a little oil slick left on your tongue. Now, that insulates your tongue a little bit, but fat, of course, also is a great carrier of flavor. So as we start talking about modifying how you perceive flavors, I think that is a functionality. For one, um, the fat will isolate your palate a little bit more from what may be a very harsh experience. If you're thinking about quality control in a cigar factory, those could be very young cigars, fresh off the table, fresh off the roller's table, um, high moisture content. So you're looking for defects in that kind of scenario. And you probably are dealing with something that may be a little harsher than the uh, final consumer experience may be. So your palate may be protected a little more from, let's say, steamy harshness, from tannin, from bitterness, from astringency. And that way you can focus a little bit more on uh, the actual flavors that may already be present in that cigar. The fat also may dissolve some of those flavors and amplify them. So um, some flavors are not soluble in water. And that is one of the big criticisms of using water for um, our purposes. But it's the closest thing we have to our saliva. That's why we use it but fat may actually bind flavor and aroma molecules out of that smoke and make you taste them longer. Um, if that is a good thing, I'm not quite sure. I'm thinking about especially defects, if that lingers around more and now you have a greasy slick of something that is very odorous and you keep tasting and you can't easily rinse away, uh, I'm not sure that enhances your experience. For a technical objective, such as looking for a defect, it may be immensely helpful. Um, similarly, and this is something that not in a technical sense usually, and not on the first time I smoke a cigar, but of course um, for enjoyment I do uh, enjoy exploring, is um, alcohol of some sort, because basically the same argument applies. A lot of flavors and aromas in the smoke of a cigar not being soluble in water may be soluble in alcohol. 
Now, alcohol is a tricky one because a lot of the alcohols we drink are very strong flavored themselves. So they will modify and leave flavor and aroma uh, before we have that puff and actually interact with it. So um, in some cases, we're halfway on the route to a gourmet pairing, which is another podcast of, um, of Franca's that was hugely uh, interesting. But from the tasting perspective, you want something that doesn't interfere with the smoke and doesn't interfere with your ability to taste. So you would need something that is fairly neutral. Uh, vodka comes to mind, but of course, a regular vodka is at least, let's say, 37% uh, alcohol by volume, uh, 74, I guess, in the US, or let's call it 80 proof, 40% in most markets. At that strength, that alcohol will numb and anesthetize your palate. Uh, especially when it's warm. So maybe the solution is throw some ice in there. No, but now we're back to temperature. Now you have alcohol that is physically numbing on top of the cold actually numbing your palate. So that is a very tricky one. Um, you would want to have something that's probably a lot more dilute. So if you th you're thinking vodka soda, uh, you may be onto something and I should try that again sometime. If you dilute it far enough to where you can get some functionality from the alcohol, as far as flavor goes, probably around 10% somewhere, um, then that may be interesting if you're already familiar with the cigar and you want to explore, am I missing something? What am I missing? Um, what is there that you normally cannot taste and perceive in the cigar? Um, straight alcohol, as I said, usually a little bit counterproductive. And of course, you know, there is the physical impact of alcohol on top of nicotine. We're mixing stimulants now. So um, depending on what it is and your general physical state, you know, de depending on how heavy that meal was, um, alcohol uh, intoxication, inebriation will probably not help your ability to taste. So a lot of different considerations uh, to go there. Um, this is not a pairing seminar. We've, uh, we have other programs for that and it's something we uh, probably will continue to revisit. But uh, famously, wine is one of those things that can make for a gourmet pairing and a very good experience, but is incredibly difficult to pair with cigars. And especially red wines, which people usually think about, red wines can interact with cigar smoke in many ways that are not very pleasant. So. Um, for a technical tasting, I would say, unless you always have that same wine, it's probably not what you should go with. That's a brief brush on alcohol, and maybe we'll have questions about that. Um, other things that people perceive as natural pairings uh, would be coffee, for example, and we're solidly, again, in the realm of pairing, I think. Um, it is one of those approaches that uh, we use in gastronomy a lot, which is uh, taste things that come from the same place. So coffee grows in the same areas that tobacco grows, all those things. But of course, coffee, again, a stimulant. If you think about your caffeine uptake, as well as that nicotine that you may be absorbing from, uh, from that cigar, maybe not a good combination. The other thing is, Everybody will claim, of course, that if you brew your coffee right, you will not have any bitterness. But uh, we talked about Kona coffee earlier. Um, there's few brewing methods available to a lot of people that produce the least uh, amount of bitterness. It also depends on the beans, the roasting, all kinds of things. So bitterness is a huge red flag. Um, even if 30% of the population nowadays are not very sensitive to bitter anymore, it is one of those things that has a lot of carryover effects. So if you have coffee, you saturate your bitter taste buds on your tongue, those receptors are now taken up, which means you know, less likely to taste some other things as well. Um, we can train ourselves to like bitter, but our, our gut reaction, our immediate reaction usually is to dislike it. So your brain will, in the beginning at least, amplify that bitter signal and say, bitter, that may be toxic, may not be good. So it will just interfere with your sensitivity there and it will linger. Uh, bitterness is one of those things. Um, 
I haven't looked it up in a while, but we have over 30 different receptor types for bitterness. That is how deeply rooted it is in our evolution, in our evolutionary uh, history. And a lot of those are receptors that become saturated and then do not free up for quite an amount of time. We could be talking minutes, could be talking hours, um, depending on what you're doing. Now, if you ate something that was oily again, maybe that will bind the bitter, uh, bitterness causing molecules and wash them away. But now you've changed one interaction for another. So not ideal. The other thing, of course, is um, coffee is generally consumed warm or hot. And people have slightly different tolerances for those things. Um, I'm one of those people that does not like hot things at all. I eat my food lukewarm because I, I like to taste flavor and I don't like burning my tongue. And I just happen to be quite sensitive to it. Um, you're introducing a temperature gradient there. You know, you could have iced coffee, uh, similar on the other end of the spectrum. Either of those will interfere with your tongue and palate's um, ability to taste what is in that smoke for one, you know, taste interaction as well as the physical impact of the temperature that you're um, exposing yourself to. Um, same would go for tea. Uh, teas can be incredibly enjoyable combinations with cigars, but again, it depends um, on the serving temperature. Teas have a lot of tannin, so you can get a lot of bitterness or astringency from the tea, unless you try and cure that with the addition of sugar or milk and cream and all those things, depending on uh, which culture uh, you're used to uh, when it comes to your tea, maybe that squeeze of lemon. All of those are sources of error and bias in how you perceive that cigar that you're trying to smoke and assess. So for enjoyment and hedonic purposes, everything is fair game as long as you enjoy it, I guess. But uh, if you're really trying to taste nuances and assess that cigar as objectively as humanly possible, you probably want to avoid a lot of those interactions. Um, I think that's a reasonably good closing point for now and opening it up to, uh, to questions from there. I'll glance at my notes one last time, but I think um, the, the realm of hedonics is a nice note to end on. This, is, uh, this has been so exhaustive. I mean, I think that many people, including me actually, had questions in mind, but you've just <laughs> covered really all the topics that I could um, think, um, think of at this point. Um, just checking Albert's question again. So you spoke about when, you talk, when we talk about foods um, that have a strong influence on smoke, you, you spoke of, of course about spicy foods. Are there any other examples that we can mention that, have, that are foods and that have a strong influence? Um, anything that leaves a residue will have that effect. So we talked about anything that has bitterness or um, a fat component. So I'm thinking chocolate right now, which has all those things. Mm -hmm. um, another gourmet pairing uh, kind of aspect and something that you would get with your cup of coffee when you have it with your cigar. Um, there's a lot of things going on with chocolate. First of all, it has a lot of similar flavors and aromas that cigars have. So you will get a similar experience at the cost of saturating those receptors and then maybe not perceiving it as much in the, in the actual smoke. Um, you definitely do have an element of uh, fat, which will linger for a little bit. Um, milk fat usually or cocoa butter, depending on what kind of chocolate you're talking about. So you will get the functionality and the interference from that little bit of oil slick that you will have on your palate. Um, chocolate has, of course, acidic components. So depending on what chocolate it is, it may not taste sour, but it will have that effect of shift, uh, shifting the pH of your saliva in that case and affecting uh, what, what you can taste that way. And lastly, of course, sweetness. Uh, depending on the chocolate, you may not even perceive it, but there will be sugar in there usually. And um, that could be positive and negative. It's usually there to balance the bitterness, but really um, you're combining two stimuli. The receptors are perceiving those two stimuli. It's just that in our mind, those two balance and cancel each other out, 
which does not mean that physiologically speaking and mechanically speaking, you've still blocked those receptors for the time being. And you're still getting interference from that. Constantine, I wonder if I could um, refine that question a little bit by saying, of in, course. The, in the course of smoking a cigar, if, uh, and this is, this is more in the enjoyment slash pairing rather than the objective uh, assessment category, if the cigar is, say, um, a little bitter and you want to make a correction, yep. um, I can think of two ways. One is to have something sweet to balance. Yep. And the other way is to have something um, that's more bitter so that the cigar bitterness doesn't seem so bad after all. <laughs> um, uh, depends on how much of a glutton, a glutton for punishment you are, I guess. <laughs> um, so I'm not sure the overpowering thing, uh, unless you enjoy that. And I keep referring to bitterness is uh, these days almost an acquired taste. We have a lot of things that are bitter and we have learned that they're generally not toxic to us anymore. So um, we can start to enjoy them. It's a very fine line to walk. And sometimes you're trying to mask it and you're still amplifying it. Um, or, of course, you're, you're actively suppressing something right there, right? So you're taking away from sensitivity by uh, amplifying that bitterness with something else. Um, the sugar and sweetness, yeah, uh, depends on the level. You don't want to go overboard where you have a, you know, a long lingering sweetness, uh, probably, but a little bit uh, may go a long way. Um, acid can uh, definitely affect how we perceive bitterness. So um, I haven't tried a, a, a seltzer water with a squeeze of lemon in a while with a cigar, and it sounds counterintuitive, but for bitterness, that may help. Um, it will also modify how you perceive that cigar simply because you have something very sour that's saturating your, uh, your palate. Um, if you have something that's a neutral oil, that would work with bitterness as well. So lots of different options. I mean, there probably is a reason why a lot of people do enjoy sodas with cigars. So if you're thinking of a cola type product that is um, sweet and quite sour, it's probably serving those two purposes. Thank you, that was very good. <laughs> of course, and we could continue this for hours, of course, just on that one topic. <laughs> Yeah, um, so they brought up uh, an another interesting product. So yeah, I've seen many studies that basically agree uh, on water crackers being one of the most effective cleansing products. Yeah. But I guess what you said regarding nuts is useful here, isn't it? It's really fascinating, I think. Um, I unfortunately like salted nuts too much, but no, I'll find some unsalted ones. I'll uh, try it myself. I mean, if you wanted to abstract that to, to its logical maximum, you could probably just take half a teaspoon of oil. Now, it would need to be um, a very neutral oil. Uh, almond oil, if it's not rancid, if it's fresh almonds, you know, that flavor goes away pretty quickly and the oil may persist. Um, there are products, of course, I'm thinking specifically medium chain triglycerides that are a very specific type of fat with relatively little flavor. So it's always that balancing act of how much flavor and masking are you introducing with that. But it's, uh, it's interesting and I'll definitely try it out. It's, it's several functionalities, right? I'm not sure it enhances, well, it only enhances certain aspects, right? I could absolutely see how it enhances any off flavors and defects if they are present. I also think that it's probably much more a protective measure of, you know, you're doing something as a job that is very irritating and you're safeguarding your palate a little bit more if you're, you know, assessing half a dozen cigars or something in a sitting that may be incredibly useful because even if you're a train smoker and um, even if you're used to it, you know how that sensation just builds and how your tongue becomes drier and drier and uh, the fatigue sets in and all those things. So um, it's a management strategy, I would say. Right, thank you. 
You know, based on all of these, I would say, yes, the Garcian's panel is on water and we will stay on water. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, I mean, the nice thing with that is, and this is an ideal scenario, of course, and some, uh, something that probably the consumer can do much more easily than um, our panel most of the time. But uh, if you have a box of cigars, you know, that first cigar you probably want to enjoy um, as cleanly as you can and see what it gives you. And either you hang on to those cigars and see how they evolve over aging, which is yet, you know, a whole different topic, or you will continuously have a cigar from that box over a course of a couple of weeks and months. And uh, once you have a sense of what you think that cigar is giving you, you'll start playing around with it. So on your second or third cigar, you know, you'll have a different drink with it, you'll pair it with something else. Um, if you really want to go the technical route, you know, some people like keeping the tasting diary or just a diary in that case of, you know, what mood was I in? What did I have before? How did that affect my, my ability to taste? Maybe even so um, lots of possibilities there and a good reason to, uh, to never just have a sample of one. So either just one cigar or one person tasting something, of course. Awesome. So now I've recuperated the question from Valerie. Um, so she asked, any exercises uh, that we could do to develop our olfactory and our language, uh -huh. to develop them and keep them in sync? So mm -hmm. that's an interesting um, question. It goes a little bit off the topic, but it's very interesting. Yeah, of course. Uh, could you repeat the second half of that without making them so any exercises that we could do to yep. develop our olfactory and our language? Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, lots of things there. Uh, first of all, this is going to take time, of course. Um, it depends a little bit on what product you're dealing with, but what you generally uh, will find is start paying more attention to what you're smelling, which is always the first step for people. I mentioned that <clears throat> we, excuse me, uh, we usually walk through our lives without noticing as many smells as we really are perceiving. So could be a ritual, you know, smell your spice rack, uh, smell various things. If you take a walk, you know, smell the roses is what they say, but basically pay attention to what you're smelling and you will find that a lot of those are associated with emotions which of course for the tasting purpose, uh, you have to divorce yourself from a little bit, which is another tricky part of that exercise, but you will probably find a lot of things that you may not like as much. You know, I'm thinking uh, you may smell a trash can inadvertently, not because you're close to it, but because it's a hot day, it was left out. You could smell um, car exhaust, uh, two tacked exhaust off a moped, all those things are things that will pop in your mind and will make you notice. And the important thing there is if you pay attention, you can start building those connections. The first thing is you recognize this is a smell and I know what it is based on where it's coming from. Um, that is where, you know, the repeated exercise of going through your spice cabinet or your herbs or just whenever you're cooking and uh, working with different foods and products you're working with that so you know what it is and you smell it. And over time, that helps you grow the synapses to where you will have that aha moment. And I'm trying to remember, I think, you know, when I started doing this for wine tasting, I was quite young, so it was uh, not very frequent tastings, was guided tastings, all those things. So uh, it took me over two years until I had that aha moment of I smelled something and not only did it see, seem familiar, but it was not that moment anymore where I said, I know what that is, but I can't put my finger on it. It was the moment when I first recognized that is, in that case, I, I remember which Spanish wine it was, and I know it was raspberry and white pepper that uh, stood out in that specific moment. And from memory, I would say there was probably vanilla in the background, all those things. So. It's a learning process, but if you enjoy it, it's an incredibly rewarding one. Um, I mentioned guided tastings, of course. I always, uh, with one caveat, I always value those very highly. Um, 
I do like the ones that merchants do. So wine merchants sometimes will have, let's say, trade fairs or trade shows that are open to the public. Um, you can have guided tastings with producers, of course, if you're thinking wine or beverages or cigars. Or there are, of course, a lot of um, guided events with um, sales reps as well. And uh, I like sales reps and I, I don't want to diminish their effort, but of course, the sales and marketing story of something is a slightly different objective from the purely educational one. So um, your mileage may vary on that one. And you know, uh, experiences are to a degree always different between people. It's what, as a panelist, uh, you spend a lot of time on is aligning what people think, uh, trying to align what people think and perceive, I guess, and you can do that as training exercises, but uh, basically there is no, no truth that is written in stone. So if um, a sales rep tells you specific tasting notes, you're likely to agree with them because it is incredibly suggestive. If I tell you this tastes like that, you are very likely to agree and perceive that in and off that moment. It may not be representative of your whole experience though. So there is always that personal element to it. And uh, we could spend a whole new seminar just on that. But I think that's a good uh, overall introduction, right? I think, uh, Constantine, uh, knowing Valerie <laughs> and um... Uh, I think I understand the question in a different way. Because I uh, developed a factory sense. Uh, but no. I think uh, her question is more, how do you develop your olfactory and the language? How mm -hmm. do you connect them more easily? Uh, yeah. And I believe that emotions could be the answer. Would you agree? Um. Uh, I still understand it from that training uh, perspective, but uh, yes, recognizing emotions as part of it is going to make it easier. The question is if for um, the purpose of tasting, you try to tune those out, but of course uh, you can do that later. Um, what we find generally, of course, is that negative impressions tend to stick much more easily and then the very positive, elating, euphoric ones also tend to stick um, there is danger in the, the tie to memory and emotion to some extent, or, you know, it does, of course, uh, amplify your enjoyment sometimes, but uh, they, are, they are different things. If it helps intermittently and then later you can go back and reflect on it consciously, um, that would be very helpful. Now, we talk about uh, developing our a connection between olfactory and uh, speech centers by yeah. smelling, smelling our spice rack and so on. Um, I wonder, is there a way to more directly develop the tobacco specific connection by having mm -hmm. a tobacco spice rack? In other yeah. words, grab your Corojo shaker from, from the spice rack and smell that grab your Habano 2000 or whatever. <laughs> Is there a way to do that? So we are directly developing that connection rather than saying uh, uh, this tobacco, which is not cinnamon, which is not chocolate, which is not cedar. Um, we're going to call it those things because that's the closest we have in our, in our minds. But in fact, it really is something very specific to tobacco. That's a nice question. Uh, you were at the, um, at the parlor meeting we had with Claudius Groy, right? Uh, and yeah. we were talking about this. It's, it's very interesting. But uh, I'm curious to hear Constantine's answer. Um, so ideally, yes, you, uh, we would have that. Um, you can target certain things. You know, there are tasting kits out there for wine that you can use that are a little more uh, off the beaten track than your spice rack is. So if you think about barnyard aroma or leathery or something, there are standards out there. Um, for tobaccos per se, um, Franca, David and I have done a little bit of work um, as part of a project for Davidoff where we infused uh, cigar tobaccos into a base and then spiked specific aromas that we found in those, uh, in those cigars into it to amplify it. So you would have a background aroma, 
of that specific cigar, let's say a um, Davidoff Nicaragua Robusto, for example, and you would then elevate the white pepper or the cedar element or the specific aroma so it's in a different context. But um, so nothing like that exists per se that you can buy off the shelf, um, which you know leaves the fun of enjoy, uh, exploring that to the uh, individual to some extent. I would be hesitant to make a standard for a specific type of tobacco just based on how many variables there are in the climate, in the country, in the processing of that tobacco. So um, unless you take all of them, you know, if you said Corojo, to th uh, Corojo, for example, if you got samples of all the Corojos from all the different growing regions and try to extract them, um, I'm not sure you would get something that is very distinctive um, because you're basically taking all the different differences and trying to combine them together and that usually makes for a very muddled experience. Um, I'm sure master blenders have a sense of that just based on experience. If you work with the same tobacco year in, year out from the same farm and all those things, you can hone in on that just like a winemaker who walks the vineyard every single day will have a site specific uh, memory. But uh, for the consumer to generalize whole swaths of tobacco and even just wrapper, uh, wrapper components is very, very tricky. I mean, if you think about it, Corojo wrapper could be anything from not quite a claro, but it could be a very light shade to a Maduro, to a colored Maduro, Oscuro, all those different things, depending on process alone, let alone growing region, individual processes of a factory, all those things. Um, it would be nice, but that is where, if you enjoy the journey, uh, you don't mind the detour. Um, not a very satisfying answer, I guess, but uh, that is the state as is, um, yeah. Yeah, well, it's fascinating how many variations there are. I mean, there are different kinds of cinnamon, just to pick cinnamon. Yeah. Faces, different varieties. But yeah. every one of them is cinnamony without mm -hmm. any question, at least in yeah. my limited experience. But yeah. what I hear you saying is that if you take Corojo and you add the, the varieties of Corojo, number one, the soils and locations where it's grown, number two, and mm -hmm. finally, the post-harvest processing, number three, I don't know how many permutations that is, but <laughs> it's a big number. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, you know, cinnamon is a good one. Vanilla is another one. Uh, if you talk to a vanilla extract maker, just based on where the beans were grown, processed, extracted, all those things. Yeah, it's all vanilla, but uh, some of it is floral, some of it is earthy, all those things. So really what would be nice if to have the Corojo spice cabinet where you have, you know, a hundred different ways of uh, how Corojo is treated and extract them the same way and smell for the subtle differences. But then that again would not give you a complete picture because there's still seasonality, all those things. Yeah, yeah well, thank you very much. Oh, my pleasure. Um, yeah, thanks Albert uh, to um, we have an interesting question from Indiana Ortes, who is a, a, a blender herself. Um, mm -hmm. I don't know if you know her, Constantine. So uh -huh. she's asking, could you like to um, would you like to explain the difference between sour and bitter? How do you describe what you sense in your palate? Yeah. That's a good one. And of course, that is coming from uh, the sour bitter confusion that we see a lot. Um, I kept mentioning that a lot of people these days are not very sensitive to bitter. And there's two aspects to that. Um, I already mentioned 30% of people um, simply don't have the number of receptors and the density of receptors for bitter. So in comparison, they are uh, much less sensitive to bitter. It's just uh, something that over evolution, as our food supplies became safer, we have lost. Not necessarily a, bit thi a bad thing. So those are people who drink their coffee black, which I still do, even though I hate it. Um, those are people who probably love Campari, which I really do not like. So um, 
there's genetic variability there, not as much in uh, perception of sour, but a lot of times sour and bitter occur at the same time. So if you think about biting into a lemon, it will be intensely sour and bitter from the pith at the same time, or sometimes the, um, the actual juice is bitter as well. So it is something that in a lot of people's minds, until you, you train them, are interchangeable or connected. Uh, there is a cultural element to that. It's very much a uh, Western world um, confusion there, maybe because of how we use those things in cooking. Um, if you want to speculate on that. Um, the way to train yourself there is to taste especially acidic things um, by themselves. So you could go with lemon juice, you could go with vinegar, all of those in water at different dilutions, of course. Um, I tend to find, and this is where it becomes tricky, but I tend to find that sourness for most people is more a whole palate, whole tongue kind of uh, experience. You've probably seen tongue maps where tastes are regionalized. We know that that is not true nowadays, but still people will for themselves have a sense of, I tend to perceive that taste more so on a specific uh, part of my tongue or a specific place in my mouth. Um, it's different densities of receptors between everybody. So I don't want to say that sourness is always the side of your tongue, even though a lot of people seem to think that. Um, acidity will make you salivate a lot more than bitterness does. And then the complication really is different acidities taste different. So um, fruits have different acids, mostly malic acid, which some people describe as green and sharp. And a lot of people would say that is a front and middle of the tongue kind of, uh, kind of acidity, whereas, for example, tartaric acid in uh, specifically wine and wine grapes is a stronger acid, but we don't perceive it as, um, as strongly. So people tend to describe that more as a back of the palate sensation, but uh, it depends so much on the, on the matrix and the medium, um, how you perceive those. So with acid alone, you could do a lot of different permutations. Bitterness becomes tricky now because there's so many different things we perceive as bitter. So uh, in sensory training, we always try two things. Usually one of them is caffeine in water. Uh, the other one is quinine in water. So quinine is what you have in tonic water, for example. Um, people usually have a strong preference and different sensibility between those two. You generally, you know, people may struggle with perceiving the bitterness of caffeine at a sensible level that is safe to serve to them, and they may prefer quinine or vice versa. Um, there are a lot of other molecules you can use, and um, we traditionally use something called PROP, uh, P-R-O-P, which is an abbreviation, and I'm not going to bore you with a chemical uh, name because I don't Prio, I don't entirely remember it right now. Another one is PTC. Um, those were amino acids that are bound a specific way and tend to be very bitter to anybody who can taste bitter. The main problem with using those is an ethical one because they are implicated as potentially carcinogenic. So um, by virtue of it being harder to get them approved, they are not as widely used in testing and screening anymore. Um, it's something you would see in a hospital these days, not as much in tasting studies anymore. Um, does that begin to answer it? Or you could obviously at some point start to mix both of those sensations to see, can you distinguish them if they're there at the same time? Um, if you make your own tonic water at home, they sell kits um, for making your own tonic water that have quinine and citric acid, and you add it to taste. So if you want to do that kind of experiment, mixing the two at different proportions and tasting those solutions will give you a good idea of, uh, of what is what, mostly because you know one is one, you know the other one, and then you start combining the two. So um, it's more an exercise of consciousness, I guess, than, uh, than anything else. Yeah. Indiana, um, if you're still listening or uh, also anybody else in 
my podcast, uh, there is an episode that is called Another Sensory Exercise, and you can find the recipes for building these exercises that Constantine mentioned, but you can make them at home with products that you can buy at the grocery store rather than lab specific um, products. So hopefully that helps too. Are there any other questions from, uh, from here, from uh, Zoom? You're quiet this time, guys. Is it because we are live streaming? <laughs> I have another question. Okay. Uh -huh. <laughs> this is going back to the, the differences between tobaccos. We yeah. talked about the, 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 the jillions of permutations of a Corojo, so it makes it very diff difficult to define specifically what is Corojo. <clears throat> flavor and aroma uh, sensations. Mm -hmm. um, is there uh, enough difference between, say, Corojo um, and, um, and other tobacco varieties that uh, more than half of the time we can distinguish uh, an experienced person, a yeah. person that really works with these leaves, can tell um, by smoking a, a pure Corojo cigar, and this is some hypothetical thing, versus mm -hmm. one that, um, and now I'm blanking out a very other cigar variety, a tobacco variety, but is it possible? Criollo would be the next one, I guess. Yeah, the logical one. Uh, Criollo would be oh, yeah, the next Oh yeah, Criollo. I, I left that up because it seemed too, too similar. Okay, uh, is it possible to distinguish reliably between a Criollo and a, and a Corojo if uh -huh. someone is experienced, or is even that too many variables? Yeah, so uh, that is part a philosophical question, part a statistical question. Um, experience and exposure are everything, right? So um, I'm, I'm convinced that professionals working with those things every day can tell them apart reliably. If they have access to the full spectrum of everything, maybe a different question, but within what they can draw from, which usually is, you know, one country or certain growing areas, or if you're at the right level and you're buying from all different countries, different suppliers and all of that, you can absolutely build that experience. Um, it will keep shifting, it will keep evolving with each, uh, with each season and all those things. But um, in general, you know, there are enough trained professionals who can do this within the limitations of what they are working with. In a global sense, that now becomes the philosophical bit. If you want to believe that anybody can have access to enough time, resources, all those things to have an exhaustive uh, sense of that and maintain it. Um, arguably, yes. But then the statistical part of that question is a lot of what Franca has been doing at Cigar Sense is looking at that because we smoke those cigars blind and you may have a sense of what it may be by how it looks and how it tastes and all of those things. And in my mind, you know, I still have a very good uh, concept of what I think an Ecuadorian Habano wrapper is supposed to taste like. But then when you taste those cigars with all the different intricacies of the blends and all of that, we can show based on the data, you know, lots of tastings, lots of different people, all these different cigars that there are some similarities, but just like in wine, you will always find the outliers. You will always have the ones that buck the trend that are a specific variety and region and all those things. But by virtue of either the blend or how they were treated, do not conform to what your expectation of it is. So um, I was doing that to Franca every once in a while where I was always for fun guessing uh, what I thought the rapper was and I don't want to know how abysmal my, uh, my <laughs> success rate was other than, you know, that's bias again. But if you look at an Ecuador Ecuadorian Connecticut or Connecticut rapper, by its you and by its tactile things, you know, uh, it's probably one of the more recognizable ones. But again, uh, growing country, season, processing, all those things, you're setting yourself up for bias and for a wrong assessment if you expect too much and if you're uh, overconfident in those things, I guess. 
Yeah, I love that um, the depth of variety and possibility in the cigar is yeah. fascinating. If I was scientifically trying to make a dictionary, so to speak, uh, I'd be yeah. pulling my head off because it'd be so difficult. But fortunately yeah. for me, I'm, I'm on the enjoyment side. Um, so it's easier. Yeah. Uh, but often um, I come across something uh, that I think is Cameroon. Now, for me, specifically, trying to identify Cameroon comes up a lot because it seems like that gets thrown into cigars mm -hmm. um, to to mellow out, to smooth mm -hmm. flavors. But um, I never know what the answer is because I don't have an answer sheet. So I don't yeah. know what my results are like. Yeah, it's tricky. And... Again, with Cameroon, I want to believe, you know, that's a very specific region. It's known for a very specific style. So it's probably one of the ones that is much more tightly adhering to something that we have an idea of. But it's just like uh, in wine, and I keep going back to that, uh, the, the dictionary that exists for wine is very rudimentary until you focus on a specific aspect. And that's either a variety or a region the variety within a region, sub-appellations of that region, and it's not all just a marketing exercise. It is, um, you can show those differences most of the times. And so, you know, within a country, you know, we mentioned Claudius Groy early, earlier, and he did uh, a pure grade tasting for us a while ago, which is just one kind of tobacco um, at a time, so you smoked your, your viso and your volado and your ligero and a wrapper, uh, wrapper type leaf separately. Um, within the regions he works with, he is one of those people that has that memory. I work with those farms, I know the differences in the soils, the mineral differences in those soils bestow that leaf with these qualities, and that's what informs him as a master blender. So he could tell you, yeah. Uh, Corojo from Jalapa has that, that, category, uh, that category of strength and it has, you know, saltiness or sweetness or whatever it would be. And uh, Esteli would be different in this way because um, that is all empirical, of course, and that is part of the charm of it. It's the, the tradition and the history element for lack of, you know, we, we don't have organized scientific exploration of it. And... It's not that they're competing. We see that in wine. We try to understand more scientifically, but it's so complex that it's not a competition. You know, it informs us. Um, it broadens our understanding. It broadens our ability to appreciate or maybe manipulate if you want to see it uh, that way in that case. But uh, it's not like there's going to be a definitive answer anytime soon, you know. Yes. Yeah. So yeah. it's not the sum of its leaves. <laughs> yeah. And you know, uh, Cameroon, I have a specific expectation in my mind as well, but it's been a long time since I had a Cameroon cigar. And again, it's only a Cameroon wrapper. And I notice immediately that's a bias because I have a visual picture in my mind of how I imagine that to look like and texture and flavors that I associate with it. And I may come across something that looks and tastes like that and is not Cameroon at all, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so I was checking Facebook. Um, mm -hmm. I don't see more questions there. At least I hope I didn't miss them again. I, I'm still learning how to do these on Facebook. <laughs> um, are there any more questions from here? Did you find it interesting? I like to say I just um, I found this fascinating because I think the one thing that we all get here and people that are involved on this call really uh, want to educate themselves on becoming better and how this whole industry evolves um, as we talk and every discussion is fascinating because we're learning so many different things from so many different experts who give us a lot of information that, um, you know, we can really take back and, and continually building on. And that's why I think Cigar Sense too 
by what you're doing is truly revolutionary because it's really teaching um, the educated consumer on how to get better, how to, to, to enjoy their cigars more um, because it is an expensive habit. This is not for everybody. It is something that um, when you, you, you pick up a, a, a premium cigar or, or wine or spirit, it's, it's not something that, uh, you know, everybody can do. So I just think uh, uh, wonderful from Constantine to, to everyone on this panel, what you're giving us. Um, I, I find it fascinating. I enjoy it. I think this is what it's all about. And I'm just thankful that you've been able to, to bring such a, a, a unbelievable uh, panel together and a community of people who really want to learn, ask questions and get better at this. So I thank you for what you're doing. Thank you, thank you so much. I need to say I didn't pay you for this, right? <laughs> no, thank you very much, Martin, uh, for being part of this because it encourages us. And uh, yeah, that, that's what we want to do. We, we want to build a community <coughs> who really want to learn and uh, who want to learn and, you know, and fact check. And uh, we hear a lot of opinions in this world. We don't have a standard education path. So it's hard. It's hard for people who want the truth. And um, so, um, yeah, that's what we want to do. We want to contribute in this way. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Martin. I thank everyone here, everyone on Facebook who, um, who participated. Um, Stan, yeah, you're always great. I mean, <laughs> that's why I invited nope. you. <laughs> Nobody fell asleep, I hope, yeah. Uh, sorry. I have no way of telling. <laughs> can I can I just uh, follow up before exiting with one one question that I think might dovetail with what's been said recently, and that is a request for whether there's any um, resource that we might go to to get a sense of uh, terroirs. Is there anything? I, and I know there's a lot of variation, but is a for example, a Corojo from a particular region, um, there are elements of uh, what you read from blenders and from reviewers that implies that there is a way of identifying the contribution of volcanic soil or the amount of magnesium or potassium in soil in certain areas that differentiate Ometepe from another region is there anywhere we might go to start kind of building that common sense? I mean, I know it's not standardized and reliably standardized because everything's subjective, but it sounds like there are some basic principles that we might start incorporating into our conversations. Yeah, uh, if you find it, let me know. Uh, <laughs> that is the, the big challenge, I would say. There is no... There's not even a library for this kind of stuff, really. So um, I've if, looked. You spend, <laughs> yeah, if you spend the time between different manufacturers and talking to people, you could probably start to compile your own. Um, obviously, Franca and Cigar Sense were trying to um, unravel it from the other way by you know, seeing what we perceive and then trying to correlate that with what we know about uh, that composition. But that's even with all the data we have, that's still in its infancy. So um, I don't have a good answer for you, unfortunately. Um, I could see how countries could, I mean, it's all political in, in that case and regulatory, but I would like countries to do that. And I think um, Honduras may be on the way of doing something um, along those lines, but your best bet are probably these days uh, manufacturers. Um, I always enjoy reading the old books about this kind of stuff. So if you read the old pocketbook companion that Zeno Davidoff wrote, or Paul Gamirian's book about cigars, they mentioned their conceptions and preconceptions of what something was, and then you realize that it's not, not much to go by, and it's decades old at this point. Mm -hmm. And, you know, approaching half a century old at this point. And even though it may be a traditional and slow moving industry, 
there's so much that's proprietary. There's so much that doesn't get asked. And, you know, it, when it comes to soils, we're trying to unravel that in wine and have been for decades, and there still is no definitive answer, you know. It's, uh, so a lot of it being empirical, meaning it is a lot of stories, and you take those with a grain of salt, and uh, it depends. If you enjoy the journey, then, you know, you will have your own library at the end of that journey, and uh, nobody knows what the actual truth may be. <laughs> Do you find, Constantine, that in wine, since we do have an example of an established uh, Appalachian terroir system yep. in yep. wine, um, is it um, inherently more distinctive in the grape world than in the tobacco world? Or are they potentially similar in their difficulty to distinguish? Um. Difficulties to distinguish, definitely, and some of that is, it's again, it's almost a <laughs> Weltanschauung is the German word, so it's almost a belief system, right? It's a worldview system. Um, we know it is founded in something, and, you know, especially in traditional wine regions, these things have been demarcated for a long time, but now a lot of times it's a chicken and the egg kind of question. We're trying to fit something to an existing system and we're trying to uh, basically, well, we're trying to justify why Cistercian monks divvied up Burgundy the way they did hundred year, hundred, hundreds of years ago. And causality is not 100% provable. So we know there are soil differences. We know there are aspect differences. We have a grasp of how grapevine physiology works in producing grapes and all those things. And then the question becomes, how much of that is wishful thinking? Um, I would say, you know, there are, depending on the variety, you can probably generalize what soils may contribute. And as I keep going back to, you know, that is an ideal and we do those studies and those differences can be there, but they can be very easily overridden by cultural practices of how you grow those grapes and how you turn those grapes into wine. And so for people who use the marketing concept of terroir, which sadly for a long time was overused, they're likely to make wines in a way that they think represents that terroir. And I've convinced myself several times working in specific vineyards that when I taste that wine later, even blind, I could pick out that one character it has. And it's different things. It's not always the soil. It's uh, sometimes it literally is the vegetation that grows around it. So um, California, um, Mountain Cabernet from Napa especially, there's a lot of wild California sage up there, and there's bay, um, bay leaf, and all these other things that we know grapes can take up, or they are oil-based aromas that absorb onto the grapes, uh, eucalyptus in Australia. So there's a lot of things that point at a place that still aren't necessarily tied to the soil. Um, I do believe that in cigars, from what I hear uh, in talking to professionals, it's a much more direct thing because it is a very fast growing plant. It is one growing season. It is very fast, uh, fast growth. Um, if really the manure and the organic component of the soil treatment affects what people claim it affects, I have no idea but there do seem to be some tendencies in what kind of minerals are in that soil and how they are taken up. But then we've been thinking that in grapes and plants don't work that way. Just because something is in that soil doesn't mean it gets taken up. So uh, it's our search for interpretation of something we perceive and can't explain. It's, uh, and I guess on top of all that, we have climate change I understand they're growing champagne grapes in England now. Yeah. And further and further up north and on uh, yeah. Swedish islands. I think Gotland has uh, vineyards on it. And I had a friend who uh, was working with vineyards even further north in Sweden. Um, so yeah, it's, uh, it's all change. Uh, well, you know, change is constant. And 
uh, we're looking for patterns and where we want to see patterns. Is there always a pattern? I don't know. And how much data do you need to find that pattern? And then you have so much data that we don't know how to find it. And uh, if you're looking for something, you will find something, whether it's there or not. That's the other, the other bias with it. Well put, well put. Hmm. I'd like to uh, add my thanks to, to everyone as well. Um, Thank uh, you. Team Franca and everybody in your panels. This is, is, is extraordinary uh, gift to us all. Thank you. Thanks, Albert. Thanks. You're all a gift to be here. <laughs> and um, yeah, it's me who thank you, um, who thank you all. Um, I'd like to say that in two weeks, we'll have Valerie here again talking about rum. <laughs> so it will be a little bit more entertaining because uh, she's so nice as well. Uh, this has been very, very technical, but extremely, extremely educational. And thanks, uh, Stan, a lot again. I'll be in touch with you. Okay, <laughs> okay bye everyone. Aloha. Aloha. <laughs> yeah, aloha. <laughs> Have a good day. Yeah, you too. Bye.